You know, I really need to start by acknowledging something that I think we all can appreciate, which is memory is pretty important uh, to all of us. And so without, without memory, you wouldn't know how to leave your room at the hotel and come down to get coffee in the morning. Uh, when you're at home, you wouldn't know uh, how to find the car keys or how to make the toast or how to catch the bus or whatever you're planning to do. Memory is that um, repository of uh, many of the happy things that, that happen to us and also uh, the sad things that happen to us. Um, well, that's what I usually say about the importance of memory. Uh, and then I was reading an article in The New Scientist from last October, um, uh, something called The Grand Illusion. And th they talked about the importance of memory so much more eloquently and beautifully than I could. And you ought to imagine this uh, being said with a British accent like uh, Richard Dawkins. But um, memory, perhaps the only thing that links the you sitting here today to the many yous from every previous day of your existence. That's memory. Without memory, your relationships would mean nothing, not to mention your knowledge, tastes, and your many adventures. It might be no exaggeration to say your memories are the essence of you. But I'm here to tell you now that there are fresh reasons and some not-so-fresh ones, reasons that I've been working on and trying to communicate for the last number of decades, reasons not to believe your own memories. So let me ask you this question. Do you think, do you think I could make you remember? If it did not happen, could I make you remember that when you were a kid, you saw a cat stuck in a tree and you rescued that cat. You did this kind of little heroic thing as a child. Could I make you remember that? Could I make you remember you were attacked by a vicious animal if it had never happened to you? Could I make you remember that as a teenager you committed a crime and it was serious enough that the police actually came to investigate? Could I make you remember that just last week you played a game, and you cheated in the game, and you took money out of the game bank when you weren't entitled to do it. Could I, could I make you remember these things? Could I pour these things into your mind and make you remember these things if they didn't happen? And if I, if I talk to lay people who don't know anything about this body of scientific work, they'd say, no way I would remember being attacked by a vicious animal if that didn't happen, or committing a crime if I didn't do it. But we'll see how you feel about this uh, in another 25 minutes or so. Because I've been studying memory uh, for, the, the, for the last number of decades, four decades or more now, and over the course of my career, I've developed a couple of paradigms for, for how to study memory. So one of them is now known in the psychological literature, in the textbooks, as the misinformation paradigm. And what, what happens here is that people see some kind of event. It might be a crime, a, an accident. Later on, they're going to get some post-event information, usually misleading information of some sort. And then finally, uh, they'll be tested to see what they remember about their, their experience. So we've shown thousands and thousands of people simulated accidents for a while uh, over these years. And in one of the oldest studies that I published, we showed people an accident where, where this little red car went through an intersection with a stop sign. And by asking a leading question that insinuates it was a yield sign, we got lots and lots of people to believe and remember they saw a yield sign controlling the intersection, not a stop sign. We've shown that we can get these kinds of results not just with college students who are participating in psychological experiments in a laboratory setting, but when you go out and you interview people out there in the real world who for some reason are undergoing some very stressful experience, 
you also can see this kind of contamination from post-event misinformation. So in some studies that I've done in collaboration with a psychiatrist named Charles Morgan, we studied soldiers who are going to survival school. In our country, we have soldiers who are going through an arduous regimen to learn what it's going to be like for them if they are ever captured as prisoners of war. And as part of this survival school, they go through a half hour aggressive, hostile interrogation. It's, ag it's, it's aggressive and hostile. It used to even involve waterboarding, although they're not doing that anymore. And by supplying these trained soldiers with misinformation, we can distort their memory for what happened during the survival school. So they might have been interrogated by the guy on your left, but by supplying misinformation, we get them to believe and remember and identify the person on your right, somebody who doesn't even remotely resemble the actual interrogator. The way we did it in this study, for example, is to take these soldiers at the end of their survival school, show them um, a photo. Remember this guy who conducted that interrogation of you that was so horrible? Did he let you talk to anyone else? Did he give you a blanket? Um, did he give you anything to eat? And the trick is, this is a photo of a completely different person. And that's all it took for lots and lots of these trained soldiers to later on misidentify the person who had conducted that interrogation. We also planted non-existent uh, objects into the minds of these trained soldiers. So there was no telephone in the room. Uh, there was no weapon on the interrogator. He was not wearing glasses. And without s misinformation, the soldiers rarely claimed to have seen these objects. But for other soldiers, if we fed them misinformation about the existence of these objects, now lots and lots of these soldiers said they remembered seeing a telephone in the room. A significant minority remembered seeing a weapon or glasses on the interrogator. So now I've shown you uh, some examples of something that's now called the misinformation effect. This is kind of a cartoon drawing of that effect. You supply people with misinformation, you put them in what we call the misled condition, and you depress their memory performance. And we think this is important because out there in the real world, Misinformation is everywhere. So we get misinformation when witnesses talk to each other after some significant event is over, when they're interrogated by an investigator who's got some agenda and com or hypothesis, communicates that hypothesis and influences the, the witness. When people read news coverage about an event, they can pick up misinformation. All of these provide an opportunity for new information to enter a witness's memory and cause an alteration, a transformation, a distortion in that memory. Well, it would be the 1990s when I would start to see an altogether more extreme kind of, of memory problem. We saw patients, for example, going into psychotherapy. Maybe they had an eating disorder, they were depressed, they had some problem that brought them to the therapy, and they come out of this therapy thinking that they were traumatized, that they were severely abused, either by fathers or, or relatives or some other people in their childhood, some of them coming to believe and have memories that they were molested in satanic rituals, that they were forced to kill animals and breed babies and kill those babies all these incredible things that they thought they were remembering. And when I first started to be involved in court cases where people were being sued based on these very, very big memories, and some of them so bizarre, it was natural to ask, well, where, where are these bizarre memories coming from? And invariably, there was some kind of psychotherapy that went on. 
some kind of psychotherapy that seemed to involve guided imagination, for example. Oh, you don't uh, remember abuse, but you got an eating disorder, you're depressed. Why don't you just close your eyes and imagine who might have done this to you? I don't know, daddy? And how old might you have been and where might it have happened? This kind of guided imagination. There was a sexualized dream interpretation going on. Oh, I remember, you know, the therapist, it's okay if you talk about your dreams with your therapist. It's okay if you recognize that day residue gets into the dreams at night and if you're worrying about something during the day, you might find it as dream material at night. But the problem with these therapists is they take the dream material and they tell the patients that this means something happened to them in the past. So the patient dreams about a snake and the therapist says, that's a penis. I, I, I guess I could kind of see that. Um, but I had a, a, a case where the, the pa in, in Seattle, Washington, actually, where the patient dreamt about a cinnamon roll and the, the therapist said that that was a penis. And I didn't quite get that one. And, and that's why cross-examination is so great because on cross, the therapist could be asked, now, what was it that caused you to know that when your patient dreamt about a cinnamon roll that that was a penis? And the therapist said, well, it, it clearly the goo on the cinnamon roll. And so I know you'll never think about cinnamon rolls in, in, in quite the same way after this. There was hypnosis going on, which with highly hypnotized people can lead to even more memory distortion. And sometimes, I think I just hit a mute thing that I was told not to, yes, um, just exposing people to false information. Well, whatever was going on, I wanted to study this phenomenon. Where, where, how is it you can drop a seed, uh, this imagination, this little dream interpretation, and out of this, in the minds of these people, can grow something as big as daddy forced me into satanic rituals and made me kill animals. The misinformation paradigm that I had developed and had used in my studies for decades, it just wasn't going to cut it. Because what was going on here was something much bigger, and so we developed this new paradigm called the rich false memory paradigm, where there is no event to begin with, but we ply people with suggestions about the past, uh, and then we test them to see what they uh, do or don't remember. And in our first attempt to do this, we planted a false memory that when you were about five or six years old, you were lost in a shopping mall, you were frightened and crying and ultimately rescued uh, by an elderly person, reunited with the family. With three suggestive interviews, we succeeded with about a quarter of ordinary men and women. Other investigators came along and planted even more bizarre or upsetting rich false memories. One group planted a false memory you nearly drowned and had to be rescued by a lifeguard, succeeding with about a third of their sample. A Canadian group planted a false memory that when you were a kid you were attacked by a vicious animal or you had a serious indoor or outdoor accident, succeeding with about half of their sample. With Italian collaborators in a study we did in Italy, we planted a false memory that when you were a kid, you witnessed someone being demonically possessed. And a, a, a fairly recent study in one of our top journals, also out of Canada, when you were a teenager, you committed a crime and it was serious enough that the police actually came to investigate. And they were so good that they were getting, reporting that getting about 70% of ordinary adults to come to believe and remember in this, uh, this made up sto story. And my own students have done the studies where planning a false memory that you uh, um, saw a cat stuck in a tree and rescued it, uh, all kinds of rich false memories. How often does this happen? 
There's a meta-analysis that was published. This is not a meta-analysis, but uh, in the traditional sense, but something uh, that these Canadian, British, and U.S. investigators came together. They took a large number of studies that had attempted to plant these rich false memories, published this at the end of uh, 2017, and they gathered information on 423 subjects who had gone through these kinds of suggestive procedures using a common coding scheme, discovered that about 30% of the time people developed a false memory, and an additional 23% of the time people developed a false belief that this had happened to them, even if they didn't have that sense of recollection. We think that's important because just getting people to believe that something happened to them is, is in some sense, the, the first step down that royal road to developing a rich false memory. Other investigators, and we too, have used a variety of other techniques, often techniques that are modeled after this suspicious psychotherapy that we saw going on in many of these court cases guided imagination or dream interpretation, hypnosis, and so on, these can lead people to develop rich false memories. We've also shown that if I plant a false memory in you, it has repercussions. It can affect your later thoughts, your later intentions, your later behaviors. So, for example, in some of our work, we planted a false memory that you got sick eating a particular food, sometimes pickles, sometimes eggs, sometimes strawberry ice cream, and people don't want to eat those foods as much. You can put these foods in front of people in a picnic-type setting, and people eat fewer of those foods after they develop a false memory of having gotten sick as a child. And you can do the opposite with people. You can plan a warm, fuzzy memory, which we did about asparagus, and people are more interested in eating that healthy food. And by the way, these things work not just on food. So we planted a false memory that as a teenager, you got sick on a vodka drink. This hasn't worked for me, but for many of the subjects, <laughs> people are less interested in having a vodka drink. So I get asked lots of questions about this phenomenon, the, the malleable memory and the development of false memories. And so I know what some of your questions are. Is there any way, for example, to tell the difference between a true memory and a false one? And I was reading my hometown paper, the LA Times, and uh, there, was an, there, there had been an article about uh, Woody Allen and the fact that his uh, daughter, Dylan Farrow, had accused him of sexual abuse when she, back when she was seven years old, when Woody Allen and Mia Farrow were going through a terrible, terrible breakup. And now the grown-up Dylan Farrow uh, is in the public eye again, saying, you know, in light of the Me Too movement, maybe people will believe me now, because I was abused by Woody Allen even though at the time there was a massive investigation by Yale investigators and no finding of any abuse whatsoever. Well, what caught my eye in the LA Times was a letter to the editor. And you can't read that letter, but I've blown up the part I want you to read. She says, as a, a therapist who has worked with many sexual abuse victims, I can recognize when the stories are valid, and Dylan Farrow's story rings very true. So I'm reading this thing, I'm thinking, what is ringing for this lady? What is ringing that makes you know, because you see her on TV, or you read a quote from her in the newspaper, that her story is true when you know nothing else? Maybe, She's responding to the emotion of the situation, and so we can ask, are true memories more emotional than false ones? And in some work done by one of my former graduate students, her dissertation work, we showed that, in fact, false memories can be held with exactly as much emotion as true ones. Well, how about, how about the brain? 
And, you know, maybe if we could uh, get some neural signals when people are recounting something that's false, it would look different than when they're recounting something that's true. And so with a couple of uh, scientists who know a whole lot about functional magnetic resonance imaging, we put people into a scanner while they're recounting false memories or true memories, and the overwhelming result is the similarity in the neural signals. So we've got a number of ethical issues that we can think about because of this mind technology. And probably the, the one that comes to mind first is this. When, if ever, should we use this mind technology? Is it OK to use it uh, to allow people to live a happier or healthier life? Or, or should we think about uh, banning uh, its use? When I think about the future now of this line of work, here are just a couple of thoughts. It's kind of a scary future. One of the best ways to manipulate somebody's memory is through doctored photographs. We showed this, for example, in a study that we did in which we showed subjects some photographs of public events and asked people whether they remembered seeing these events in the, in the public eye and to write about what they did remember. So do you remember when our former president shook the hand of the former president of Iran? A number of people said yes. How about this? Do you remember when President Bush was vacationing during Hurricane Katrina on the Bush Ranch with the famous baseball player Roger Clemens? A lot of people said yes. And one of the things we found back then is a lot of people said yes, but whether you said yes depended on your political orientation. <laughs> so the, Repu the uh, conservative Republicans were more likely to fall for the false uh, story that made Obama look bad, and then the reverse was true. They were somewhat less likely to fall for the political story that made Bush look bad. Our most recent paper along these lines, it's kind of a scary one, published with my Irish colleagues just a, a month or so ago, a false memory study conducted in the context of a referendum on abortion in Ireland. Ireland has one of the most restrictive abortion laws in the world, at least it did until last year when there was a referendum. Before then, women basically had to go fly to England or somewhere else to get an abortion. It wasn't going to happen in Ireland, but now with this referendum, uh, the ban on abortion uh, was list lifted. Um, we showed voters in Ireland, some 3,000 of them, some true ads that appeared by those pro-choice groups or the anti-choice groups. And then we made up some fake advertisements and stories. And again, I'm not going to walk you through the data uh, from our paper that was just published, but just to tell you, uh, like that Obama uh, and Bush study that had been done before, people were commonly thinking that they remembered these fake stories and they were more likely to develop a false memory and accept and believe and remember the fake story if it made their opponent look bad. This is kind of scary. It, it says something about fake news, but in conjunction with a recent paper published just at the end of last year by Rob Nash, uh, a British memory scientist who happens also to be my academic great-grandson, he did this study. He showed some people a photograph of the 2011 wedding of Kate and Wills, and here you see them leaving in their car after the, after the wedding ceremony. That's the actual true photo. For others, he showed them a doctored photo where there were a lot of protesters and, you know, agitation in the crowd. And after showing this doctored photograph, 
Subjects remembered the event very differently and had different attitudes about whether they would want to participate and how much, what their feelings were about the whole situation. But the scary part about Rob's work is in a third condition, he, the doctored photographs were such a rotten, bad Photoshop job that the horse's feet weren't even on the ground. And even with this thing that was just screaming, it's fake, people were just as influenced by that in terms of their memories and uh, their attitudes. Now things I'm even more scary now that I've been learning about deep fakes. And if you know anything about this, you know that there is now computer technology which can make it look like anyone is saying or doing anything you want them to say or do. Uh, there was an online demonstration of this where it looked like Obama was saying something like crazy, but it, it was his voice, it was his accent, it was his mannerisms, but it was actually a comedian who was speaking through this computer technology, who, making it look like Obama was saying the things that he wasn't really saying. And the article, a great article on this had the title, Fake Media is Coming for Our Memories. So I started this, and now I'll conclude. Could I make you remember? Could I pour these things into your mind, making you remember uh, that as a kid you rescued a cat, or you had a, an attack by a vicious animal, or you committed a crime as a teenager, or you cheated? in a game last week. I didn't talk about that excellent work from some other British scientists. All of these things have been done in scientific work published recent, in the recent past that show the power of planting these entirely false memories in people's minds. <clears throat> the, uh, Leanne mentioned the TED talk I gave uh, a few years ago and I was looking for some way to leave uh, a take home message uh, if I wanted to leave you with one thought, uh, it would be this, that really just because somebody tells you something with confidence, that they say it with a lot of detail, they cry when they tell you the story, it doesn't mean it really happened. You need independent corroboration to know whether you're dealing with an authentic memory or one that's a product of some other process. And so, you know, I used to love this quote from Salvador Dali. Um, he, he is the one who once said, um, the difference between false memories and true ones is the same as for jewels. It's always the false ones that look the most real, the most brilliant. If, if I were meet, to meet him today, which I'm, he died, so probably not, but I would say, uh, you know, Sal, you didn't quite get it right. It, it's not that their false memories are more real and more brilliant, but the, the real lesson is they can be equally real and equally brilliant. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell to be notified about new videos. You can follow us on social media, and if you really love what we do, consider supporting us with a donation. Links to all that good stuff is in the description below.